worship this morning. I'm excited today to continue the series we're calling Make War, and we're talking about the armor of God today. As you can probably see, we're going to talk about the breastplate of righteousness, a powerful weapon in your arsenal as a Christian. You realize, I hope, that we are in a battle. We're truly in a battle. Uh, we're in a battle for the culture. We're in the battle as Christians. The good news is it is a battle that has already been won by Jesus Christ. That's the good news. Jesus Christ has already won this battle. Our battle is to stand in the victory that he's already won and help as many people as possible come to know him as Savior and Lord by shining his light and shining his love. But in a battle, we need to understand that as soldiers, we need to be fully armed. That's why we're looking, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, of the armor of God. We're looking at each piece of the armor, what it stands for, what it does, and how you can put it on to be a fully equipped soldier. And today we're going to look at the breastplate of righteousness. Paul said, stand your ground. Understand this is already ground that Jesus is one. We're standing our ground, putting on, we talked about it last time, the belt of truth. I did. Pastor Nate shared so well last week on the shoes of the gospel of peace. I talked about the belt of truth, and then he says the body armor of God's righteousness. Here's the thing about righteousness we need to understand is that righteousness protects us. Living righteously protects us. Now I know some of you probably, if you are a recovering religious person or a recovering legalist like I am, any recovering legalist in this place? Any recovering religious folks in this place? You got a big dose of religion growing up and you had to get out of some of that when you found Christ? Uh, if you're a recovering legalist like me, when you hear the word righteousness, you think of all the things that you're supposed to do and more so the things that you're not supposed to do. For many people, when you heard me mention righteousness, you thought I'm going to give you a big list of all the things you're supposed to stay away from and all the things you're supposed to do. I want you to understand, uh, true righteousness comes from, we talked about the belt of truth. You put on the truth, which is Jesus Christ. You surround your life with truth, which is Jesus and His Word. You listen to the truth. You have a relationship with the truth, and you live the truth. Righteousness is an expression of the truth that's in your life. When you make a decision that you're going to walk in truth, how many have made that decision you're going to walk in truth? No more secrets, no more hidden life, no more sneaking around, no things to be ashamed of, but you're going to walk in truth, you're going to be who you are, and you're going to be honest about who you are, and you're going to dedicate your life to the truth that is Jesus Christ. Righteousness is not a list of rules, and it's not a list of do's and don'ts. Righteousness is living out of your relationship with Jesus Christ and allowing Him to be expressed through your life. Righteousness is Jesus. Righteousness is not a religion. Righteousness is not a denomination. We have people from many different denominations. We're part of a denomination, but we have many people from different denominations coming to this church. Righteousness is not about one particular denomination or another. Righteousness is about Jesus Christ Himself. His life living in you and through you. His life determining your attitude and your actions. His life guiding your life. The right thing to do is what Jesus would do. The right thing to say is whatever Jesus would say. The right thing to think is whatever Jesus would think. So righteousness is right living according to what Jesus would do. That does not mean in every situation you stop and say, what would Jesus do? Because you don't always know what Jesus would do. The right thing is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ every day and let that relationship shape your attitudes, your thoughts, your heart every day and take that into your public life. That's righteousness. You know what the Bible says? It compares righteousness to a breastplate. The Roman soldier typically put on the belt first. Then he would attach the breastplate to the belt and it held the belt to him. When you make a decision to walk in truth, you're ready to walk in righteousness and right living as Jesus would have you do. And the Bible says that as you do that, it protects your life. How many would like to go in battle with something like this? 
Now, you wouldn't want this one because it's plastic. But uh, if I had a real one, I'd like to have something like this. Officers carry often and wear often a bulletproof vest that keeps them. In fact, our officer Scott today said, this is the breastplate of righteousness, and he hit on it. It was a lot better than this. Righteousness protects you and keeps you from doing stupid stuff. Now, excuse me, I know a lot of people don't like the word stupid, but I've done some stupid stuff in my life. Anybody else? Wow, that's the most honest response I've ever gotten from you guys. You're learning. Second service, only four people raised their hand. And I said, really, really? Only four of us here today? Five counting me have done stupid stuff. I've done some stupid stuff. And I've done some stupid stuff a second and a third time. That's when it really gets stupid. You heard about the guy who came to work and both his cheeks were burned. He had severe burns on each cheek. And they asked him, so what happened to you? He said, well, I was ironing a shirt and I had the cordless phone on the ironing board. And he said, I answered the iron instead of the phone. They said, what happened to the other cheek? He said, well, the guy called back. How stupid is that to burn yourself twice? But how many of us have burned ourselves multiple times doing the same stupid thing? It almost destroyed our lives and we went right back to it again. Now in case you think I'm talking to you, I'm not talking to you, but God might be talking to you. I don't know your situation. I don't know what's going on in your life. But if what's said today hits you, then maybe you need to just stop and think about this. Have you ever seen somebody do the same stupid thing over and over again? Often it's relationships. Have you ever seen anybody almost ruin their life with a bad relationship with the wrong person and they finally get free of that person and they go pick another one just like them? Anybody ever known somebody like that? Again, I'm not yelling at you, but maybe God's talking to you. And you just want to grab them and say, didn't you learn anything the last time? You ever, anybody ever want to tell anybody that? Didn't you learn anything the last time? Hear me. An unrighteous life produces an unguarded heart. Hear me. An unrighteous life produces an unguarded heart. The breastplate guarded the heart above all things. And it's very interesting in the book of Proverbs, we are told to guard our hearts above all else. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else. We like to guard our wallet. Guys, you ever go to a place and put your wallet in your front pocket? Or do you in a crowded mall or somewhere out at the amusement park and you're always checking to make sure your wallet's there? Pickpockets look for that. They look for you to check for your wallet to figure out where you keep it so they can steal it. Some people are more careful with their wallet than they are their heart. Unrighteousness exposes your heart to terrible pain. Let me tell you something. If you're single today, I'm going to help you today. I'm probably going to make you mad, but I'm going to help you. If you're single today and you've just come out of a broken relationship, you need to wait a year before you get in another one. At least. Thank you for that applause. But some people are like, no, pastor, if I wait a year, I'll miss Mr. Right. No, you'll miss 16 Mr. Wrongs. Because Mr. Right is not on the prowl to catch you right on the heels of a broken relationship. Mr. Right is not going to date you when you're broken. You can be mad at me if you want to, but I'm going to tell you the truth. See, I've got my armor up here. You can't do anything to me. Go ahead. Can I give you singles another wonderful piece of advice that will make you mad but will help you? Don't sleep with anybody till they've committed their lives to you in marriage. Can I help you? My Lord, let me just tell you, I'm not up here to condemn you. If you've already messed up, you're not here getting beat up this morning. No way. 
If you've messed up time and time again, Jesus Christ can forgive you and redeem you. If you'll run back to Him and run back to righteousness, He'll turn your life around today, starting right now. Some of you need to do it today. You need to make a decision today before you leave this place. Okay? And He'll forgive you. He'll take you back. He'll restore everything you lost. He can do that. So I'm not beating you up today. But I'm telling you, don't be stupid. You could tweet that. Don't be stupid, Pastor Andy. Pretty simple, isn't it? Don't sleep with somebody that hasn't committed their life to you. All you do is complicate your life. All you do is mess up your relationships. See what happens when you sleep with somebody. You think it's just, oh, it's just casual sex. No, 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 no. No such thing. The time you sleep with somebody, you're giving them a piece of your heart. And you give your heart away too many times to people who don't value it. And you're broken. You make sure they value you enough to commit their life to you before you give that piece of your life to them. Are you with me? That's how righteousness guards your heart. I've never heard a person come to me and say, you know, I just wish I'd slept with more people. I wish I'd had more one-night stands. I wish I'd cheated on my spouse more. I've never had a person come up to me and say, you know, I started dating this person and they told me they wanted to save themselves for marriage, so I decided that was a bad thing and broke up with them. See, that's what everybody's looking for. You want to be the person you're looking for. Otherwise, it's blatant hypocrisy. Can I get an amen? amen? Righteousness protects your life. Well, preacher, people say stuff like this to me. Preacher, if I don't sleep with him, he'll break up with me. Exactly. <laughs> bye bye. See you later. If that's what you're after in my life, I don't need you in my life. If all I am is a sex object to you, I'm not giving myself to you. Come on. Come on. Get it. Righteousness protects you. Keeps your heart from being broken. See, God's not up there saying, <laughs> let's come up with another rule so we can keep them from having fun down there. Come up with something else. That guy's enjoying himself. That's a sin. Now, God's not doing that. God invented marriage and sex and all of it. He invented it for joy. And he knows how when we get outside the boundaries he set, we become destructive. Listen. Listen. Just stop and listen today. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. It'll protect your life. Now, big mistake we make is we try to make our own righteousness. Your own righteousness stinks. You look up at your neighbor and say, Pastor Andy's just blunt today. Righteousness stinks. I've been sick for a week. I'm just blunt now, you know. Oh. Your own righteousness stinks. When you try to be righteous. You ever, you ever told God, God, I promise I'll do better next time? How many have ever done that? Hear me. There is a little bit of pride in that. Because somehow you've got the idea that you can do better. And the Bible says you can't do any better. And if you're honest with yourself, your experience tells you you can't do better. Because when you go out, you're going to keep doing the same things you've been doing. Because by yourself, you have no righteousness. Isaiah wrote it, and he said it very powerful. He said, our righteousness is like filthy rags our righteousness is like filthy rags he said when we display our righteous deeds they're nothing but filthy rags you know what Isaiah was writing about you ever seen a filthy rag I first started in ministry <coughs> one of my early ministry experiences several of them was on the mission field in Central America and we would go out to impoverished places and do dental clinics and we were basically there going out with dentists and just 
trying to help them clean up and set up and do all kinds of things. What I didn't realize is they were going to actually ask us to pull teeth. We were overrun one day by hundreds of people who had never seen a dentist before. And they had bad teeth that needed to be pulled. And there were more teeth that needed to be pulled than there were dentists. So the dentist handed me what looked like a pair of pliers and said, Go pull that man's tooth. And I said, You've never seen me with a pair of pliers. This is torture. She said, This was years ago. She said, That guy's got to have that tooth pulled. And I've got ten patients over here. She showed me how to do it. And she said, Go pull his tooth. So I grabbed that poor old man's tooth. Just started working it back and forth. It's that bad. He sat there. Poor guy. He bound the thought, man, I got, I'm just blessed. I got this great dentist coming from North America to pull my tooth. He didn't know he had a wannabe preacher who'd rarely held a pair of pliers in his life. And I'm pulling that tooth back and forth. And he just sat there calmly with tears running down his cheeks. I felt bad. I was going to cry myself. And I told the dentist, are you sure? She said, that man's going to suffer a lot more than this if you don't get that tooth out. So finally, out came that tooth. I don't know if I was more relieved or him. Never forget. I could see him today. If I, I saw him today, I would know him, probably because his mouth was on. <laughs> anyway, I said, what do I do with this tooth? She said, there's the tooth bucket. I got a piece of gauze with that tooth in it and went threw it in the bucket. I went over and looked at that bucket. It was already half filled with teeth and gauze and blood. Are you disgusted enough now? <laughs> that is what Isaiah meant when he said filthy rags. He literally meant cloths filled with bloody human waste. That's what our righteousness is compared to God. The best you can do can only get to the level of filthy rags. When Jesus' righteousness is perfect and pure and holy. Do you know the breastplate of righteousness? We talk about Isaiah 59. If you read the book of Isaiah, you're reading a whole lot about Jesus. It's filled with messianic prophecies, which is prophecies talking about the coming Messiah. In Isaiah 59, he's talking about Jesus, and he said, He put on righteousness as his body armor. Meaning, the breastplate of righteousness is Jesus' own breastplate that he invites us to put on. That was better than the few amens I got. Jesus' own righteousness is what I had the privilege of putting on in my life. Why would I want to trade it for my own? I'll do better next time. I'll tell you something, friends, you're not going to do better next time. You need to get on the real breastplate of righteousness that Jesus Christ wears himself and offers you to put on your life. My righteousness can't compare to his. Can't even begin. You say, Pastor, how do I get this? How do I put it on? You receive his righteousness by faith. Doesn't that sound a little too easy? The recovering legalist in me says, that's too easy. You've got to work a little harder for it. You've got to suffer for it. The truth is, he suffered everything on the cross. He took the penalty unto himself so I wouldn't have to. He died so that you and I could be made righteous by faith. Jesus told a story one time about two men that went up to the temple to pray. And he said, there came in a Pharisee who's the religious guy, who's the preacher. And on the other side, there came in the tax collector. And to the ears of the, the guys in that day, they automatically knew who the good guy and the bad guy was. Kind of like an old western movie. You ever turn on an old western and you immediately know who the good guys are and the bad guys? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Any of you ever watched Gunsmoke? Matt Dillon? Man, I love that show. The bad guys always get it at the end of the show. Last five minutes, Matt Dillon comes in and cleans a town up. You always know who a bad guy is on gun smoke. Always. It's obvious. In this story, Jesus set them up, though. He set them up with the good guy and the bad guy because the Pharisee, in their minds, was the good guy and the tax collector was the worst guy in town. And he said, two guys come to church and pray. And the disciples are thinking, what's that tax collector doing there? 
Pharisee belongs there, but that tax collector's a rotten, dirty thief. What's he doing there? And Jesus said both of them pray. And the Pharisee tells God how good he is. You ever done that? Where'd all those hands go? You ever, you ever prayed and told God how good you've been? I have. I don't know about that. I'm, I, Nate, I must be the worst sinner in the church. You have too. Okay. Nate and I are the worst ones here because we've done I've told God before, God, I've tried serving you for so long and look what's happened. God, I did so much for that family and served them and here they left the church and talked bad about me and gossiping and lying about me and I did everything I could to serve. Anybody ever done anything like that? I tried to be nice to those people and that's what the Pharisees were saying, God, you got a prize here. Thank you, Lord, and I'm not like that. See, the Pharisee had the whole concept of righteousness was the do's and don'ts. He told God all the things he didn't do, then told God all the things he did do. And I'm going to tell you, God doesn't want to hear a list of your wonderful accomplishment because Jesus died on the cross as the ultimate accomplishment of righteousness, and God doesn't need your help. You got the tax collector here who is the bad guy, and he just comes over, and Jesus said, this guy just said, this was his simple prayer. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. See what he did? He admitted he was a sinner. He did not come with any righteousness of his own. He said, I'm a sinner. And he simply said, God, have mercy on me. You're my only hope. See, a lot of your problem, you still think you got some hope. You're still prideful enough to think you can do better. You need to get to the end of yourself and realize that what you're doing is not working. You ever watch Dr. Phil? I've seen Dr. Phil before, and I love it when he says, how's that working for you? <laughs> I've used that in counseling a couple times. I love it. Really, I'm smart, I guess. How's that working out for you? How's trying harder working out for you? How many of you have come to an altar like this and said, God, I'll do better, and by Monday, you're back in the same thing? About five of us this time, all our confessions went away. Because your own righteousness won't work. Trying harder doesn't work. Reaching a place of complete dependence on Jesus and acknowledging you can't do it, but He can, that works. That works. The Bible says in Genesis 15, talking about Abraham, Abraham was quite a guy. He's the father of multitudes of nations. He was, had a close relationship with God. And here's what it says about Abram. Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. It said the Lord counted him as righteous. It literally means God put righteousness in his account. Have you ever seen money appear in your account that you didn't know was coming? Anybody? Maybe just once in your life? Anybody? Anybody? How many would like for that to happen to you once before you die? You would like to see that happen. <laughs> like when a deposit's made in the account. I was in a bank the other day, and I was putting a check in the bank, and uh, the lady asked me to show her some ID so I could make a deposit. And I was just being the smart aleck that I typically am. And I said, ma'am, why are you asking me for ID to put money in this account? I said, anybody that comes by is welcome to put money in this account. I don't care who they are. If at any time in the future, anybody of any background, I don't care what they look like or smell like or talk like, if they want to put money in here, let them put it in. In fact, invite people in the lobby to come put money in this account anytime you want. Please, don't stop them. Don't require any form of ID to make a deposit. We laughed. But you know what that verse means? Abraham believed what God said, and God deposited righteousness into his account. It doesn't say Abram earned it. It doesn't say he made promises to God about how good he was going to behave. It didn't say anything, but he simply believed God, and God said, direct deposit into Abram's account of the righteousness of God. That's what happens. Back to the story of the temple. The Pharisees praying his prayer, telling God how good he is. 
The tax collector, the publican, is saying, God, have mercy to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that man left the temple justified. You know what that means? God gave that man his righteousness. Somebody told me this about justified. Any of you ever worry about your past? How many people ever worry about your past? Ashamed of something in your past? How many? I'm with you. You know what the word justified means? An old Bible college professor told me justified. He said justified just as if I'd never sinned. I kind of like that. Justified. Meaning God has removed your sin as far from you as the east is from the west. And justified you. And he did that not because you did better. Not because you earned it. Not because you turned your life around. But because you believed the Lord. And he did it because of faith. Because of faith. Musicians, come on, I'm going to quit. You ever worn a white shirt or a white dress or a white suit? Anybody? You put on anything. When I was a kid, my mom got me a white suit. I looked like Boss Hogg from the Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> if I'd had the hat, I would have looked like that. <laughs> she told me we'd go to church in that suit, and boy, I stood out. I take that back. I look like Elvis coming on stage. That's better. I can live with that better. She told me, she said, don't you go out in the yard. Don't you get near the car. Don't pet the dog. When you're clothed in something like that, you want to keep it looking nice. Right? Sometimes we've sinned enough that we see ourselves as dirty. And when you're wearing something dirty, it's easier to get dirty. But when you begin to see yourself as clothed with the righteousness of Christ, and when you begin to realize how much He loved you and what He did for you and what He gave up to give you His righteousness, there's something powerful about that to inspire you to a righteous life. What is righteousness? It's not trying harder. It's getting to know Jesus every day and letting Him shape your attitudes, letting Him shape your heart, Letting Him change you. And letting that truth that He is work its way out in your life every day. Amen. Jesus will change the way you see the world. Jesus will change the look on your face. Instead of driving down the road looking like you hate the world, He'll put a smile on your face. He'll change your heart and your attitude. That's what righteousness is. By faith receiving Him. By faith, receiving His cleansing and beginning to see yourself like He sees you. Did you know when God looks at you, He doesn't see your sin? Thanks for the three amens. Do you folks read the Bible? When God looks at you, He sees the blood of Jesus Christ that has washed your sins away. And He doesn't remember your past. And He said, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. That's done. It's over with. Your future is ahead of you and it's bright because of Jesus and what He did. Receive His righteousness. Get rid of your own. Give up on your own and receive His by faith today. And it will protect your life like a breastplate. Amen. Let's pray today. Jesus, we love you and thank you so much.